name of God is the key to the understanding of the biblical doctrine of God. God's self, his real person, is concentrated in his name. His name is that which you and I must discover if we really understand this great mystery contained in the Bible. It is not secular history. It's sacred history. It has nothing to do with anyone that ever walked the face of this earth. The whole drama takes place within us within our own wonderful human imagination. It is there that we will find God. When the promise is made, and these characters that are mentioned in Scripture are not persons as we are, they are states of consciousness. So when the promise is made that a guardian angel will lead the people of Israel. This promise was given special force by the assurance, Jehovah's assurance, that my name is in him. For God is concentrated in his name, which simply means that God himself goes with them. Not as some guide on the outside, but within. He is your own wonderful human imagination. That is God. But the name is revealed in stages. Man cannot take the shock to give the final stage in the beginning. So here we find the statement made to so-called well, Moses. And this is the 23rd chapter of the book of Exodus. Now Moses is not a person. The word Moses is the old perfected of the Egyptian verb to be born. Something is to be born in man. Well, it takes time to be born. And the Lord said to Moses, I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, El Shaddai. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known unto them. Well, the word Lord is simply I am. I did not reveal my identity to these states of awareness. He now reveals it to this that is to be born. So first he is all power, El Shaddai, God Almighty. And man sees the symbols of it in the thunder, in the lightning, in the convulsions of nature, in the violence of nature. And he worships that on the outside. Then comes the second revelation. And is revealed to man, called Moses in this passage, as awareness which is I am. When they ask you who sent you, should they ask you, just say I am. Just say I am has sent you unto them. For this is my name forever. I am. That is who I am. To say I am is simply to be aware of being yes so. Then comes the final revelation. And that revelation is given to us in his nature, that he is a father, that it is God the Father. I have made manifest thy name, and I will manifest it. He manifests the name of Father. God is a father. Well, if God is a father, then he has a child. He can't be a father and not be a father of a child. It's revealed in Scripture quite vividly, if one could only search it, but it's difficult for man to accept it. 
So the final revelation of the name of God is Father, Holy Father. Now when we read in Scripture, Jesus Christ, if you are trained as I was trained, I was born in an environment of a Christian home. And my parents taught me the story of Christ. And they died believing the story as they taught it to me. Then I discovered it wasn't so at all. It wasn't secular history. This is a great mystery. Not something to be kept secret. These are not matters to be kept secret. But these are profound truths that are mysterious in character. So, Jesus Christ in us, we are told. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? Well, if Jesus Christ is in me, I must find out who he is and where he is. So, in me, yes. Well, in what sense is he in me? But then I make a discovery through vision, not through reason. Reason cannot reveal it to me. It all came through vision. And I go back into the Bible and I read the Bible to find that my vision parallels the story of Scripture. I've come to the conclusion that Jesus in me is God the Father. And that Christ in me is David, his son. And there is no other way that I will ever know that I am God the Father unless his son revealed it to me. For no man knows who the son is except the Father. And no one knows who the Father is except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal it. It's the most incredible story in the world, and the story is this, that God the Father is going to give himself to every child born of woman. No one will be left out. Every child born of woman, regardless of what he may become in the world, the most horrible monster, it is still God pledged to himself, to give himself to man. As though there were no other in the world, just God and you, just God and I. Believe it, and this most incredible gospel will become to you possible. And the only way you will know it's true is when Christ, reveals you to yourself as God the Father. And the Christ who reveals you as God the Father is the Father's Son, and that Son is David. In searching the Scripture through the rational mind, I could never have discovered it. It simply happened. It revealed itself to me through vision. Now I know it's a difficult thing for man trained as I was, and trained and doubted as many of you were, to accept it. For I was not trained that way by my mother and by my teachers in school. And when I read the Bible with the background as a fixed idea that mother stuck into my mind, and then the teachers confirmed that, and then the ministers confirmed it, to have a fixed idea of Jesus Christ as a man of history who lived 2,000 years ago as something external to us. I could read forever with that fixed idea that Jesus Christ in you is the hope of glory. I wouldn't see it. But I hear the question asked in the book of Corinthians, do you not realize that Christ is in you? That Jesus Christ is in you? Test yourselves and see. Well, it would mean nothing because it has to come through a fixed idea that would block it. So reason could not get to it. It had to be revealed. And so the day came in my life when it was revealed and the block was removed. And his son stood before me. And it's David of biblical fame. And there is no uncertainty as to who he is. I'm looking at it and no uncertainty as to our relationship. 
I am his father. He calls me father. And I know I am his father, and he knows that he is my son. And that's the final revelation of the name of God. You will not in eternity know that you are God until that final revelation when his son calls you father. Then your journey is over. You simply linger for a while to tell it to anyone who will listen. Some will listen and some will not. Now let me share with you a vision of a friend of mine who is here tonight. It's biblical. On the surface, you will think, no, that's only a dream meaning nothing. But let me give it to you as best as I can recall it. It's not a long one. He said, on the seventh, this is on a week ago last Sunday, I woke in the morning, on Monday morning, and I knew I had a most significant dream. I knew it was of tremendous importance, but I could not recall it. Try as I did, I couldn't recall it. But I had to be about my business because my son had to be up. I had to prepare his lunch, get breakfast, and get into the unproductive before 8 in the morning. So here, I got the lunch, got our breakfast, and I'm off to the dentist. I'm sitting in the car waiting for his return from the dentist. And I looked out through my window in the car. And across the street, I saw a sign. It read, not the complete sign, only a partial part of the sign. It read, complete vision. And it triggered my memory as I saw complete vision. The dream began to return. And the whole thing became so vivid, I relived it. As though I'm actually repeating the whole thing once more. And this was the dream. I found myself in dream, looking out upon a sea of humanity. There were hundreds of thousands of people swelling from an apex into an enormous thing, say like a pyramid. And I noticed as I looked at them, they all seemed independent of each other. They could move as they felt like moving. No one was completely tired, bound by another. And although they seemed completely independent of my perception of them and the perception of each other, I noticed they're all tied together. They were tied by a black chain, each attached from the breast, attached to me too. And everyone was attached to the other. And although they seemed independent of each other, they were all attached to each other. Then I turned around, and now I faced the opposite. My back was this enormous sea of humanity. As I turned around, I'm looking at you. And never, you are radiantly beautiful. Just, you said nothing, you simply stood there at the very top of the pyramid. And you looked at me. And then it dawned upon me the significance, the meaning of this dream. I noticed on your breast you too were attached. The same chain that bound me to this whole vast crowd also bound you. You were attached to. But I knew without asking anyone, I knew you were the top stone. You were the leader. You were the pattern. You were the head of it all. And then, as I knew, and you knew that I understood the vision, you smiled. And then the chain began to become invisible. Yet I knew, in spite of the chain becoming invisible, it is still tying us all together, all linked together, as one being. It becomes invisible as it is invisible here now. You don't see yourself tied to anyone, and you are convinced that you are completely independent of the perception of anyone in this world. You see no link. Yet, Scripture teaches, I dwell in them, and thou in me. 
Oh, Father, I have made manifest unto them thy name, and I will make it manifest, that they may be one as we are one. I dwell in them, and thou in me. And may they be one as we are one. So you could say, I and my Father are one. Not one can be lost in this world, for we're all linked together. Every one will be redeemed, because God himself is in everyone. And there is nothing in this world but this relationship between God and his Son. And God and his Son is buried in every child that is born in this world. And when that child grows into maturity, I don't mean physically maturity, I mean spiritual maturity, and he awakens from the dream of life, he is God the Father. And because God is a Father, he being God the Father, he has the Son of God as his Son. And that Son is David. As told us in Scripture. And I will tell of the decree of the Lord, said David. He said unto me, Thou art my son. Today I have begotten thee. These are the words of David in the second psalm. Then said he, Rise and anoint him. This is my chosen one. To whom is it said? It said to David. To whom did David speak and call Father? He called Jesus Father. If you read it carefully in the Gospel. And David came in the Spirit and he called him my Lord. Well, my Lord is a term used by every son of his father. So he spoke of Jesus as my Lord. That is, my father. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So he was inspired in spirit, and there he met his Father. That is the search of everyone in this world, to find the Father, the cause of the phenomena of the world. What is the cause of my misfortune? What is the cause of my fortune? What is the cause of everything that is happening in my world? The Father is doing it. Putting me through all the furnaces in the world that I may actually inherit God. Actually, actually become one with God the Father. And there's no power in the world that can convince me that it's so unless his Son reveals it to me. I can stand here from now to the ends of time and I can persuade you to the point of convincing you that it's true until the Son appears and calls you Father. But I can tell you, I am not speculating, I am not theorizing. I am telling you what I have actually experienced. And I do know the vision of this lady. She's here tonight. Now let me quote from Zechariah. The word Zechariah means Jehovah remembers. She remembered after she saw one little sign, as I've told you time and again, everything in this world contains within itself the capacity for symbolic significance. A little bird flying by could trigger a memory that is gone and bring it back. The little little sign, or the sign at the end when the car drove off, the completed sign was complete vision aid, selling eyeglasses. You wouldn't think a place selling eyeglasses could trigger so profound a vision, but everything contains within itself the capacity for symbolic significance. That little sign triggered it, and the whole thing came back that she could not, with all the effort she made in the morning, she could not bring back and recall the vision of the night, yet she knew when she woke she had a profound experience. She knew it was a tremendous significance, but she couldn't bring it back. And a simple little sign, complete vision aid. But she didn't see the word aid until the car drove off. Now, here in Zechariah, and he brings forth 
the top, the top stone, amid shouts of grace, grace to it. Well, who brought grace into the world? We are told in the book of John. And the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Prepare so the top, he said, you were the top. It came through grace. Now, in the 10th chapter of the same book, I just quoted the 4th chapter, the 10th chapter. And out of them will come the cornerstone. And out of them will come the nail. And out of them will come every ruler. Out of them, this whole vast sea of humanity, and we are called out of that sea of humanity one by one by one, and every one will be the Lord Jesus and his Son Christ, as told us in Revelation. And the kingdoms of the world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. They're separated for us. The 11th chapter a revelation. Yes, the kingdoms of the world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. They don't tie it together as you find it in the Gospels and the letters of Paul. They're separated in the last vision to show you that they are not a surname like Jesus being surname Christ. No, they are entirely different. It's a father-son relationship. That's when you are pronounced righteous. For the man who fulfills the conditions imposed upon him by a relationship, which is the father-son relationship, he in biblical terms is called righteous. And that's the crown of righteousness that is set up for the man who reaches the end, the top stone. As Paul said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth has made up for me the crown of righteousness. When you come to the end, you receive the crown. For everyone will receive that crown. Because everyone will be in the end the Lord Jesus. And humanity together is symbolized in the boy called David. If you took the whole vast sea of humanity, and all of his experiences, and then fuse it into a single being and personify it, he will come out as David. So David is not, not for anything more than humanity personified as a single youth. So humanity is the son of God. And God, believe it or not, is personified in Scripture as Jesus. And you are that God. But you do not know it yet. But you will know it. One day you will actually have the experience. And you will know that this is only the shadow world. And what we call history in scripture is not history as we understand history. It is not secular history. It is salvation history. It's sacred history. And the whole thing unfolds within the individual. And the day will come and you will know that from beginning to end it's all vision, from Genesis to Revelation. But man has confused the entire issue by making a little God out of this little thing called Jesus, called Christ, called Peter, called that. These are not. These are states of awareness. The whole thing is unfolding within man. The whole drama is contained within man. And one day it will unfold within man, and he is the God of the universe. Now, let me show you the story of the pay. All these things happened to me without any contemplation. I never heard them, I never read them in a book. And here one night, suddenly out of the nowhere, I find myself talking to twelve men. And we're all seated on the ground. And we are dressed in an ancient manner, as depicted in pictures, say, of the first century. 
Just plain robes, that's all. Simple robes. And a room square like this. Not as big as this, but a square room like this. Say maybe 30 square. One door is the entrance into this room. And to my left, as I sat on the ground, was one door. As I'm talking to them and telling them, as I'm talking to you now, giving them the story of the Bible, just teaching the Word of God and explaining what I know from my own experience, reinterpreting Scripture in the light of my own experience and making it, the words become alive. And they all seated on the ground. And one of the twelve quickly jumps up and leaves the room. And I knew exactly what he's going to do. He is going to reveal the fact that I am talking about an entirely different king. The king that is housed in everyone. A different lord altogether. Not a Caesar, but a lord housed in everyone. That everyone is king. Everyone is the lord. Everyone is God. And there's nothing but God. And I'm telling these stories based upon my experience. One jumps up and he starts out. And the minute he goes out, I know exactly what he's going to do. He's going to tell that I am teaching this story. In a matter of seconds, comes a man, tall, handsome, fine-looking man, about 40 years of age, beautifully gowned, the most expensive gown. And he walks like a great soldier. And he walks as straight as you could walk up the aisle, turn at right angles to it, comes down that side, right angles, comes to the middle, then he turns at right angles and he comes straight in front of me. And he stands before me, and an attendant of his passes him a mallet and a peg. And then he takes that mallet, and then he takes the peg and he hammers it into my shoulder. Blow after blow. It didn't hurt, but I heard every blow as he nailed it right into me. Then he took a sharp instrument which the attendant gave him. And one circular motion, he severed my sleeve of my tunic. And then he took his hand this way and pulled the thing off and revealed my exposed arm from my shoulder to my fingertips. And there I stood before him with a completely unveiled arm. And that thing driven into my shoulder. Then he stretched his hands out like this, like a cross. Then he embraced me. And he kissed me on my right neck, right side of my neck. And I kissed him on the right side of his neck. And then the whole thing began to fade. And as it's fading, I am looking at the discarded sleeve. It was the most beautiful shade of blue, light baby blue. And I knew it was quite a lovely thing to watch it cast away that way. But the hand was completely exposed. Now listen to the word, the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. Lord, who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Then the 22nd chapter of the same Isaiah. He nails it into the shoulder of the one that he has chosen. He pegged the nail. And on it he hangs all the utensils of Israel. Only for a season. He will rule for a season. Then it will break and all these will fall. His rulership will be at an end, and then he joins those who have attained to bliss. Each will play their part. Each will have their experience. I am not alone in her vision. She saw me as the one at the moment in a different sphere altogether. It's not the world of Caesar. It's an entirely different sphere. And I will not deny that she saw correctly. I know she saw correctly. For I am fully aware of what she saw. But I cannot be boastful about it because everyone is going to be called. Not one will be left. Not one is lost in all my holy mountain. And the one who precedes 
is not better than the one who follows. Because you can't precede God and be better than God. It's all God. There's nothing but God in this world. The whole vast world is God made visible. And he is concentrated in his name, and his name is in us. And that name is I am. That is God. There is no other God. So do not turn on the outside to find any other God. You will look in vain. This is the only reality. God. And he is housed and concentrated in the individual. So if that individual goes berserk, it's perfectly all right. He still is linked to the one who thinks himself so good. And the one who is so good, who may be called tonight, is not better than the one that he condemns in this world. The whole vast world is linked together, every one of us. As she saw it so clearly, from breast to breast to breast, and when, when the thing became invisible, she still knew, though invisible, we are tied together. Even the one who is now the top, the one who is the ruler, the one who is the head, he is not divorced from that fabulous crowd, unnumbered people. The base was enormous. I got thinner and thinner as it formed the pyramid to the top. And when you bring forth the top corner, so it is by grace, which means it's a gift. You do not earn it. No man can earn this. Grace means an unmerited, unearned gift of God. And that gift is God's gift of himself to man. And no man is good enough to earn it. So let no one tell you that he earned it through hard labor, and this did it to so-and-so, forget it. We all go through the furnaces. Everything in this world that seems so horrible, you either have passed through it, or you're going to go through it. Don't think you're going to escape by anything that you've done. Not a thing. You will pass through it. So do not judge by appearances. And judge this man is very marvelous because he's rich. And that one, because he's not wealthy, as something that God has ignored. Forget that. It has nothing to do with these little tags that hangs upon man. Everyone will be redeemed. And the redemption is, the gift is complete. And the gift is God's gift of himself to man. And God's name forever and forever is I Am. But remember, he is not only Almighty. He's not only aware, he is a loving father. And humanity is his son. And humanity gathered together and fused into a single being comes out as David. And David stands before him. And I can't describe to anyone the thrill when you find the son who brings back your lost memory. Because it's not now. The minute you see him, you know you're always the father of David. You had suffered from total amnesia. And then comes your son before you. And here, you know exactly who you are. So they will say to you, but is he not the son of Joseph? Do we not know his parents? And what does he mean saying that I came down from heaven? What does he mean by saying, I and my father are one, and my father is he whom you call God? Well, why listen to him? He's insane, and he has a devil. Read these words in the book of John. The 10th chapter of John, he has a devil. He's insane. He's mad. Why listen to him? Because we know his parents. We know his brothers. We know his sisters. And he dares to say, I came down from heaven. But may I tell you, you did. No one ascends into heaven, but he who descended. And therefore to ascend, you first have to descend. And you lose all memory in your contact with man. This is completely the touch of amnesia. The minute you touch man, 
and penetrate these bodies and annex these brains, you suffer from amnesia and think that you are John Brown because your mother's name is Mrs. Brown, your father's name was Mr. Brown, and they name you John, so you think you are John Brown, and you've completely forgotten who you are. You are never John Brown, save for the moment that you are playing the part, as you annex the brain of the little body that is named John Brown, it became a portion, but only a temporary portion of your soul, and through that you ride it, you ride these bodies, as you would ride an animal. Take good care of it, but don't think for one moment it is you. You are the immortal being. You are God expanding, and this is how he expands. He comes down and assumes the limit of contraction, all man. And then he bursts the shell and begins to expand, and there is no limit to expansion. It's forever and forever. He's only set a limit to contraction and to opacity, but not to translucency and to expansion. So this drama, I tell you, is true. But the Bible, the greatest book in the world, is completely misunderstood. They don't understand it. They teach it as history. And they're looking for all kinds of things. Our archaeologists are looking all over the world to try to find the evidence for the story called the story in the Bible. You're not in eternity, find it. They're looking for some little sepulchre where Jesus is supposed to have been buried. He's not buried in any sepulchre outside of the skull of man. The only burial ground of God is the skull of man. That's where he's buried. So they go to the Near East to find the so-called holy sepulchre. And they carry all these things into that little place and think they're on holy ground. Take off your shoes where you stand. For so where you stand is holy ground. If you're leaning up against a bar, that's holy because you are there. That's where God is standing. But God is sound asleep in man. And he's dreaming the dream of life. One day he will awake in man. And he will awake in the grave. And the grave is the skull of man. And he will come out of that. And all the drama of scripture will unfold itself before him in a series of the most fantastic mystical experiences. And then he'll know who he is. Then he tells it to the best of his ability. Not all are equally, I would say, not gifted is not a good word, but equally qualified through lack of training to tell it. I would like to tell it in writing, but I am not trained as a writer. I write, but I do not consider myself a writer. The matching of words of thought on the printed page, I have not really uh, indulged and applied myself towards it. So I have not told it as vividly and as clearly as I would like to tell it. But others will come and pick it up and they'll tell it. But it doesn't matter, I'm telling it from the platform to the best of my ability. And I'm telling you what I know and I'm not speculating. I am not engaged in any speculation trying to set up some little workable philosophy of life. I go back to scripture and find that I find there confirmation of what is happening in me. It was always there, but I didn't have the ability to see it, not until it happened in me. So when people talk about Jesus and you think of something on the outside, or they use the word God, or they use the word Lord, and your mind jumps outside of yourself to that something on the outside, you have a false God, and a false Lord, and a false Jesus. If the name Jesus causes you to think of something other than yourself, you've got the false Jesus. For he is concentrated in his name, and his name is in us. That's what you're told in Scripture. And that name forever and forever is I Am. That's the name. That's your own marvelous, wonderful human imagination. That's God. That you misuse it, no one can deny. But the day will come when you fully understand it and fully accept it, you will not misuse it any longer. You'll be completely in control of your imagination and what you're doing with it. 
So his name is actually concentrated in you. And that is his real presence. And therefore he's not on the outside. Don't think for one second you'll find him better in the cathedrals of the world or the synagogues of the world when they have all these things and hidden veils and all these it's all nonsense all nonsense you step into a cathedral or a synagogue and you think you're in holy ground no wherever you are is holy in the presence of one you love that is the holiest of holies that's the holy ground you love one and really love one you're in love with the universe. Try to love the universe. Can't do that. Love one, and you're in love with the universe. And I'm telling you from my own experience that the expression, God is love, is true. In spite of the horrors of the world, that statement is true. I stood in the presence of the Ancient of Days. Where? Must be within myself, for he dwells within Yet he seemed at the moment to be another, because he questioned me as though he were another, and asked me to name the greatest thing in the world. But when I answered love, he embraced us, and our bodies fused and we became one body, one spirit, one Lord, one God and Father of all. Yet I did not lose my identity. Then he sent me into the world. So I know, being fused, I cannot be defused, therefore the sender and the saint are one. So in the capacity of the saint, I appear and do act less than myself the sender, only in the office of the saint. But in my essential being, having fused with this one, I am one who sent me, I sent myself. So the sender and the sender one. But I am limited while I am in the office of the saint. And one day I will take off this little garment which I annex, and then I'll return to myself the sender who is God the Father. Having told the story as I was sent to tell it. But I am self sent. And one day you will be self sent. You will draw yourself into the depths of your own self and stand before the Ancient of Days, it's yourself. And you will answer as I did. So make no mistake about it, he will ask you a very simple question, what is the greatest thing in the world? And you will answer automatically. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love, and you will embrace yourself, and you are one. Then, at that moment, you are sent. And if the same words ring out in your ear that rang out in mine, these are the words, down with the blue blood, which does not mean destroy society. It has nothing to do with the social structure of the world. It means all external rituals, all church protocol, for it's an empty, empty shell, meaning nothing. So when you see all the rituals and people turning to this as something sacred, forget it. It's all within you, so done with all church protocols, all ceremony, all rituals. And you can go to the Christian church or the Jewish church, and they all have the same external ritual. If you've ever gone to a synagogue on the day of a bar mitzvah, it was my great pleasure to go to a bar mitzvah. And we all divided based upon whether we are one tribe or the other. Well, I was not a one or the other, but I was invited, so they put me on one side. Because it was the boy's father who invited me. So I went there. And when they brought the scroll out, when they came to the name of God, he took his wonderful robes and he covered the name that you may not look upon the sacred name. Well, I mean... A man wrote that. That whole scroll was first of all made by the human hand. And it was written by a human hand as it was written. And yet man then worships the works of his own hand. As we do in the Christian churches. Every little thing up there was made by man's hand. The candlesticks, the candles, 
the little icon, the little thing called Jesus on the wall, the cross on the wall, who made them? Man's hand made them, and he turns around and worships his own hand. He works of his own hand. So I tell you, the words that rang out in my ears when I was sent out to that wonderful square within me is done with the blue blood. And then it was revealed to me after I came out. It means church protocol. Every external form of worship, all rituals, everything of that nature, you're not going to find him there. But I'll tell you, you're going to find him. And when you find him, the Bible will become alive to you. For the whole thing is now a written word. And the words become alive because you have experienced it. And so then you reinterpret scripture in the light of your own experience. And you realize you are the God who actually dictated it. For these are the words of God through his messengers, the prophets.